Hey everybody, Ash here, and it's time for more Legions Imperialis. I hope everybody's having a great day, um, and thanks so much for checking out all the videos on the weekend. Um, if you caught this as it was going up in 2023, people might watch this in the future, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but it was a ton of fun to shoot those, um, and I thought it would be fun to do a video which I hinted to before about why I am such a stan for the epic scale of Warhammer 40,000 games. Um, it is a piece of history for me. Uh, it goes way back to the beginning of my hobby journey in 1988 to the first box that I ever owned and a game called Space Marine. And the reason I'm so excited, I did all those videos that past weekend uh, for this game and it's got me excited that like a game hasn't gotten me excited in a long time is the deep sort of like nostalgia and resonance I have for this era of Warhammer 40,000. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to break down the timeline of Epic uh, in the History of Games Workshop, what it kind of meant for the business um, and what it kind of means now, what, what, what full circle we've come on in this journey. So let's dive in and talk about the history of Epic Warhammer 40,000. So first things first, we have to talk about this box. This box right here, the Adeptus Titanicus box. This box, in fact, which is an unpunched copy of Adeptus Titanicus. Yes, uh, indeed, I, being me, somehow have a copy of this game from 1988, completely new in box, uh, and including everything from the crazy styrofoam buildings. Yes, look at these guys that would snap together at the back to make uh, city blocks. Um, to the plastic weapon sprues and titans that came in two colors. Now this is a notable um, piece of technology for the time in that it was a plastic box set and it was in fact the first, apart from the one made by the Boy Scouts and some other debatable historical artifacts that may or may not be considered war games by everybody, uh, the first boxed tabletop war game, which is to say it came with miniatures, a rule book, a box um, and could be put on a shelf and blade. And it is absolutely the first one ever produced by Games Workshop. Um, it is sort of notorious from that point of view and holds an important sort of distinction um, as the first time that they decided they were going to put all of the things together to play a game in a non-board game capacity. They made board games before, but this was something where you built and painted it yourself. Um, and it actually was incredibly popular with toy stores and hobby shops across the UK. And so it became a very important sort of like piece of their business model. Uh, the second notable thing about this box set is this is early days of Warhammer 40,000 and there wasn't much established canon as to the history of the Imperium. Um, and so the Horus Heresy was created for this box set and the reasoning for it was simply that you could include the same miniatures twice in different colors and have a civil war between two factions. There was no need to include a different faction and produce twice as many molds. Instead, you could just have the same army twice, basically, because it was a civil war. And think about the knock-on effect of that. Um, the two things, we expect now, tabletop miniature war games, to have a two-player starter set. It is a, a foundational part of the industry. And the Horus Heresy has gone from being a artifact of historical interest in the Warhammer 40,000 timeline to its own distinct brand, IP, and product line that they've developed in-house and made an absolute killing off of. So much so that, um, of course, it has its own tabletop board game separate from the Warhammer 40,000 one now. Um, these two big notable distinctions were, I think, incredibly important, but it's not actually this game, which was replicated back in 2018, five years ago, um, that is, of course, the thing we're talking about today. The thing we're talking about today is Legions Imperialis, uh, which previously, in 1989, hot on the heels of the success of the Deputy Titanicus, was called Space Marine. Um, this box is equally notable. It was an infantry expansion for Titanicus, or could be played as its own standalone tabletop war game, um, and included a huge number of miniatures, land raiders, rhinos, and infantry. Um, all of the infantry had back banners that you could make commander stands out of, and they had a ton of little sticky flags to denote what legion they were on. Um, this was a notable uh, box set because it really defined the first founding chapters, the history of the Imperium, and also includes some named characters 
spoken about for the very first time. Uh, the Sons of Horus and Horus himself are really named in the just kind of first page flavor text background of this book. Um, and some of the most sort of iconic and favorite characters from the current Warhammer, uh, the Horus Heresy novel series, like Saul Tarbitz and Nathaniel Garrow, are simply throwaway character names in background flavor text across this rule book. So these two boxes are very distinct um, and very sort of like, I think, important, not just in the history of wargaming from the point of view of the two-player starter set, but also in the history of Games Workshop because some foundational concepts in their most popular science fiction game were done not necessarily for creative purposes, but for very sort of cut and dry business purposes of, 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 of convenience, where you didn't, you didn't have the money necessarily or the capacity to produce two completely separate model lines to go in your box set. So instead you invent a civil war and you, you write background around it. And that background becomes so popular, it takes on a life of its own. Now we're gonna talk about Space Marine a little bit more because it is very much the descendant, and I would say actually just parent of Legions Imperialis. This box set game doesn't just, I would say, borrow <laughs> uh, mechanics and rules from Space Marine. I would just say that this is a new edition of the 1989 infantry expansion for uh, Warhammer. It is, or for Attempts Satanicus. It is a completely sort of um, revamped in modern terms box game and it shared a ton of even components, although they're split across multiple boxes now with this box set that we've just seen go, go on pre-order this week. Um, it came with cardstock and plastic buildings, uh, which also had rubble templates for if they were destroyed, dynamic rules for occupying and fighting through buildings, um, and generally most of the key features that were prominent in this expansion are the key driver features that are in Legions Imperialis. Um, of course, the thing that Legions Imperialis has is just more stuff. We have things today like Kratos tanks and you know all kinds of bespoke Horus Heresy stuff that we've accumulated over the years that are additional to it. But when you boil it all the way back down, um, you've got a lot of this like key sort of like format for playing the game that comes directly lifted from Space Marine. Um, we're going to go on more about that, I think, in a bit, but let's talk about the history a little bit more because we've gotten to 1989 um, and this game has, you know, boosted up in popularity. I've played it pretty much exclusively and you can see here some of my miniatures that I painted up uh, to convert to look more like they were on the unit cards. So we have my tactical stand with a little missile launcher on it. I've, I've gone and painted the different like squad type markings on my Blood Angels. So gold helmets, blue helmets for the various different unit types. And you got my command stand, some rhinos. You can see here my Titanicus um, walkers as well, kind of like for scale of what these look like. Now, obviously these were in six millimeter. They are significantly smaller than the current uh, miniatures. They have been scaled up sort of exponentially. And you can see here, as I put them together, there is there's quite the size differential between the two of them. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that my ha my Warhound Titans from the New Legion Imperialis box are at least like a half a centimeter taller than my Warlord Titans uh, from my Titanicus box set, which is fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> they should be bigger. Um, they're they're far more detailed and honestly just nicer models to paint. Uh, I have no problem with the scale being slightly increased to get like a commensurate sense of like how cool this stuff is. You don't make the table bigger, you make the, the miniature smaller instead. Um, so we're at 1989 uh, with the Space Marine expansion, and this game has gained a bunch of popularity. So they decide to include other races. They've been including them sort of all through um, the, the release of, uh, of White Dwarf as like expansions and sort of like, um, like add-on rules. A at the time, that was the main way in which games were supported. Was if you bought the magazine, you can get additional components basically added on. And that was the key value of White Dwarf. So instead of trying to sort of put all that stuff in one place, they print epic space marine and holy shit holy shit just look at this box set wow what a box set i actually went to go look for mine in the warehouse it's the only box that i don't have to show you guys today because i'm pretty sure i have a shrink wrapped one i've never opened 
mostly because I have all the components separately from the era, and I don't want to, I don't want, I only opened this copy of Titanicus because Jervis Johnson signed my rule book, <laughs> um, and I needed to get the rule book out of it to sign, so I have a couple copies of the rules, but I wanted a pristine one to frame. Um, my copy of Space Marine is somewhere in my storage unit, which is not the studio, and I have to eventually empty and move everything here, but it's, it's in the depths of there somewhere. Um, it included a Titan, ep- uh, had four different armies in it, I believe, three different armies in it, it had, um, it had um, Space Marines, Eldar, and Orcs to go along with the uh, the sort of like Imperial forces as as things you could fight against. It gave like a, a sort of like a smattering of everything in plastic, um, and these were all taken from the various battle boxes that gave you a pile of infantry, tanks, and stuff for an individual army. Um, you have uh, in 1994 Titan Legions, and this is. Where the game starts to go out of control. Uh, I would say that from whence the, uh, the accessories were a valuable asset to speeding up gameplay, right from Titanicus, there was cards for the Titans. Uh, Titan Legions, someone takes the brakes completely off the cardboard components, and most of the game table at this point, well, this is a very cool box, it contains two Mega Gargans, Bonebreaker tanks, um, Imperial Knights, uh, which get some plastic kits for the very first time, and the Imperator Titan, the biggest Titan on the battlefield, who is now smaller than a Warlord Titan. <laughs> um, you, you also got so much control stuff, and the game became such a attempt to create a simulation for the operation of some of these larger, more impressive vehicles, that it, it kind of collapsed under its own weight. The amount of cardboard on the table was was shocking. <laughs> There's almost two square feet of cardboard just to manage your Imperator Titan. And of course, everyone wanted to use one because it was the biggest, coolest thing at the time. Uh, and so there was a moment where Epic kind of sits for a minute. And in 1997, we get Epic 40K. This box is even crazier than the last one. Look, we got plastic vehicles, plastic terrain, we got a cardboard Mega Gargan, blast markers, whippy sticks. Man, this box had absolutely everything. It even put the last one to shame. This is penned by Andy Chambers um, and uses as its core rules uh, a lot of similar mechanics to Battlefleet Gothic. In fact, the firepower chart system, adding firepower dice to a total dice pool of a formation and a lot of sort of like quick play mechanics. You can hear there's, there's models in there, definitely in buildings. Um, they, uh, they, were, they were sort of lifted from BFG and applied to this game. It was a beautiful box set component-wise, coming with plastic buildings, like plastic ruins, an orc army, a space marine army. And this was the first time you didn't have a lot of like single variation miniatures. You got tons of stuff. You got whirlwinds, you got land raiders, the first of the new style land raider actually, the first of the non-Phobos land raiders. The orcs got everything from the Bonebreaker tanks that came in the Titan Legions box set, command stands with like plastic characters and stuff like that, scouts, the whole nine yards. A beautiful box set, um, unfortunately betrayed by the fact that the super streamline of the rules didn't go over very well with Titanicus um, and previous Epic Edition fans who wanted something slightly more granular. Um, detachments became less of uh, individual unique models and more a point of dice firepower added to a dice pool where they weren't firing individually, they were just kind of fast dicing on mass. It was a very competently written mass combat system, but it was too much of a departure really from the previous iterations. And so after a couple of releases, it fizzled out and died. Um, had a nice supporting cast of metal miniatures. So from 1997, we then move on to 2003 and Epic Armageddon. Now, as much as I liked playing Epic when I was a kid, Epic Armageddon is the edition of the game that I played the most. It's also the previous edition to Legions Imperialis and is the last edition of the game penned by its original creator, Jervis Johnson. This one did not have a two-player box set as this is from the Fnatic era. Uh, Jervis Johnson takes over a small studio and brings back lots of the previously loved 90s games, uh, such as Necromunda, Mordheim, and of course Epic and Battlefleet Gothic. Uh, gives them a fresh coat of paint, brings out lots of new models, and in this case, as he is the original author um, of the Epic games, uh, he does his own, I would say, penultimate copy of the rules, and this is the final edition of the game, 
penned by Jervis Johnson. Um, it is one of my all-time favorite rule books, I think, from the point of view of its layout. Um, and a lot of what I take as a miniature game designer, I learned from the design of this rule book itself. It's very well done, full of wonderful art, beautiful miniatures. And as you can see, I played the heck out of this game um, in that I have uh, four, five, maybe six painted armies for it. Uh, I have my Blood Ravens, which of course have a tiny little Gabriel Angelos converted for them, as they were my main 40k army at the time, as was Imperial Guard. So I have a large Imperial Guard Valhallen army. Um, and then for some fun bad guys, I painted up some Slanesh, because, uh, you know, having some Emperor's Children is a, a cool, fun, different color to paint when you're sick of painting gray and red. Um, and of course, some little add-ons for my Imperial forces, such as some of the Forge World Grey Knights. I played an absolute ton of this game, um, and I would say that it is probably one of the coolest editions of Epic, but it is not exactly the way things were in the beginning. It is a, uh, I would say, a hybrid between Epic Space Marine and Epic 40,000, and while it is Journal Jervis's sort of final vision of the game, and it is a very complete game with tons of army lists and almost every faction represented, um, it is quite different as it uses incorporates things like blast markers and things that Andy Chambers had, um, had brought into the game, as well as non-blind order giving. You had an initiative rating that you would roll to see if your, or your orders would be received, and you could pick orders on the fly um, in response to what your opponent was doing to go back and forth on alternate activations. Still, wonderfully competent game, beautiful miniatures, tons of fun to play, and I played the heck out of it. And so now, we have a 15-year gap. This is why I'm so excited for this game, is that the epic series of miniature games has been dormant for 15 years up until 2018 with the return of Adeptus Titanicus. Um, obviously, I was a very excited about Titanicus. When it first came out, I was lucky enough to be um, sent to the first World of Titans to go into the wild and play some games with it. Um, and uh, it, actually, it was only one World of Titan, but I painted a second one <laughs> uh, using the Imperator Titan, if you go back and watch that video, as a Warlord Titan, because they're roughly the same size. I just had my old school Warlord against my new school Warlord. Um, and Owen and I played some games. And it was, I, I would say, a, a wonderful reimagining of Titanicus. Um, with lots of innovative design and um, a great new designer um, and a very nice guy actually also worked on Silver Tower. And then we got five years more gaps. So now between the release of uh, Epic Armageddon and this game of Legions Imperialis, we have a 20 year gap. I haven't gotten a new epic scale uh, Warhammer 40,000, in this case 30,000 themed game for 20 years from 2003 until 2023. So here we are, we're back. Um, and not only have they brought out a new version of the game, they've contained it to its original setting and given it its original themes. Some people, I think, find that to be a criticism. I actually like that because it means that you can sort of, there's the, the sandbox is a bit smaller and you can have a complete collection a bit easier. You can paint and, and, and collect a complete Space Marine army uh, of one of each thing and not have it A, break the bank, because honestly, I don't think anyone should be worried about game sizes in this game. Just paint and build the models you like and then play roughly the same points as your opponent um, as we do in Titanicus. Uh, and B, um, because there's only two factions at the moment and then of course the multiple sub-factions underneath that, you can just do your favorite version of what those models represent. Uh, without wanting to collect every single army like I did for Epic Warhammer 40k. And so there we are today. That's the timeline for Epic Games. There's a 20-year gap. So between 1988 and 2003, roughly every five years, we get a version of Epic. And then I had to wait for 20 years. My childhood game basically went on hold for almost half my life. Um, and now it's back. Uh, the models are beautiful, of course, and the 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 sort of like themes have returned all the way back to the beginning. So let's talk about what these two box sets do differently from each other and which one does what better. Um, I think that the obvious sort of like place to start is the presentation of the game in general in the Legion Imperialis box is, well, it's 35 years removed and therefore has 35 years of the war game industry becoming expectant of certain things and understanding the way that people absorb information far better. The way that the layouts on the cards work, even though you have almost identical information on the detachment cards, the fact that instead of having to look up weapon systems information in the books, it's just presented the cards, you have the stream of what you need to know during a game fed to you in a much better way than you previously did. 
It's funny how other games later on in life actually owe quite a bit to Titanicus and Space Marine from the point of view of having unit infantry uh, data on cards. Um, Games Workshop used to sell in the first and second editions of Warhammer little recipe cards you would fill your stats in on, but this was the first time that presentation was like pre-populated for you and you could just pretty much at a go um, look up what you needed to have. And they've improved that a great deal obviously in 35 years. The second is the miniatures themselves. Now there's some complaints about the undercutting and flash detail from the process of doing a two-part mold. Um, I'm not honestly at eight millimeter super worried about it. It can be cleaned off. You can shape it with a hobby knife if you want to. Otherwise, the quality of the miniatures between the six millimeter original versions and today, it's pretty vastly different. Um, you got exactly one pose of Space Marine in the Space Marine box, uh, one fixed together Rhino that was a single piece, and one single piece Land Raider, some banners, some sticky banners, uh, and that was about it, banner poles and sticky banners to identify your units. The biggest variation was they came in two colors. So you could identify someone's forces basically if they didn't want to paint the models. You can't say, I don't think with a straight face that the miniatures haven't improved quite a bit in 35 years. Um, and there's a spectacular amount of detail on them for what they are and the size they are in the box. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, the, if we're gonna flip to the other side, the Space Marine box does better is it comes with absolutely everything you need. It's funny, in my uh, review of the box that I presented additional things that you would need to make the Legions Imperialis box as good an overall playability value as the Space Marine box, and that included buildings. The Space Marine box came with plastic topped, and in fact, they made beautiful plastic like like um, uh, roof pieces for all the buildings uh, and all individually full color uh, building sets. And then on top of that, if you destroy them, the rubble to go underneath them uh, so that you were able to just basically open the box, snap together or snap out all the miniatures. And because they were in colored plastic, be playing as quickly as possible. The Christmas morning test and including everything you needed was right there. Same goes with the unit cards. They're an add-on for Imperialis. They are integral to the system in Space Marine. Um, and there was a lot of thought giving to having everything you needed right out of the box. It seems that over time, we've decided to remove those things and make them additional purchases. I don't necessarily agree with that because I believe that the first initial investment in a game should be playable ad infinitum, like forever ad infinitum, um, so that you can, if that's the only thing you ever buy, enjoy that experience. I'm not a big fan of the day one DLC format of having sort of almost required elements split up into separate purchases um, from the point of view of being able to play. Not saying you can't play Legions Imperialis out of the box. I'm saying that playing on a 2D plane with no terrain is not going to put the best foot forward of the game system itself and is requiring something that wasn't previously required by the same company that made the same box set. So um, score one for Space Marine of things we have forgotten over time. Um, and then I guess the last but not least thing would be the presentation of uh, the, the sort of like the war, the background, and all of the cool sort of like features of the horror series. So it's got to go this time around to the rule book for Legions Imperialis. Um, as much as I absolutely love this rule book, I love everything that's in it. In fact, the first mention of Horus and, of course, all those named characters being in here was a big Easter egg for me when I read the first Dan Abnett um, uh, a Horus Heresy book and those names came up, I was blown away that they'd gone back to the original source material and lifted characters to make it have like a through line right back to the very beginning. Um, and I appreciate that, but obviously in the 35 years since then, we've fleshed out and expanded and created more characters and more information. So you can't really compete in that regard now. It was the very beginning back then, it was innovating and kind of like stitching ideas together. We're at a very like rote, we've codified everything. This is a product now level for Allegiance Imperialis. And so if you are getting into the Horus Heresy for the first time, you're gonna get a good overview of what that, what that world and universe is in this book, as well as who the main protagonists and characters are. So there it is. I've put together kind of a timeline of how these products worked. I'll be honest, to sum this all up, the reason I love this game system isn't just my nostalgia for being eight years old and approaching toy soldiers for the first time. 
Although I do think that there is something obviously in me that is speaking to that. So I'm not going to deny the fact that I have a soft spot for things from my youth, as everybody tends to. I think I have such a soft spot for this game over time because I've engaged with it as it's grown and changed. I've had a 20 year hiatus for playing it. And I think that it captures the grandeur and scale of War in the 41st, in this case, 31st millennium, better than any game Games Workshop has made. The idea that you can have massive titans and tiny infantry and the infantry truly are tiny and the, 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 the monsters and the, the titans really are titanic and they can crush buildings and smash things to pieces is infinitely, I think, entertaining to me and it, it is the lens by which I see every battle in Warhammer 40,000. I only want to see Warhammer in two scales, either man-to-man in 28 mil, small unit combat, or on this sort of grand, huge, Napoleonic warfare style thing with hundreds of thousands of troops fighting across a battlefield. And the presentation, obviously, of like my being able to like crystallize and see that, the lens I'm seeing it through in this scale with these beautiful miniatures has never been like clearer or prettier. And so I'm very pleased by it. Is it for everybody? Absolutely not. And that's okay. It's okay to not be into this game because it doesn't have your Eldar or your Orcs or the thing that you like about the Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 universes. That's completely fine. The, the thing that I think is great is that they have made a full circle now between their original products, the thing that created the boxed game, the thing that created the Horus Heresy, and the love with which this game is clearly being made, um, to do that full circle is something that I appreciate. When you bring back something after 35 years and you research it well and you make it feel like the original thing, I have to give that a thumbs up because you've tried to do something. You've tried to make people from that time feel something and present something to a certain audience in a certain way. Games Workshop has the resources to make a broad mass market appealing Warhammer 40,000 in this scale game. They could absolutely decide to do that. Instead, they decided to make an homage to one of their original game systems in the style it was originally made. And I find that to be infinitely more interesting than just trotting out a smaller scale version of a game they already make. Tell me a story, tell it to completion over the next five years, keep rolling out cool tiny Primarchs and little vehicles that I can collect and paint and enjoy in this one little setting. And then when I'm done that experience, I'll be done that experience. It's okay for things to end. It's okay for them to be self-contained. And it's okay for this to have a smaller audience than people think it could. And that's it. So there it is, my timeline, history, and look back at my sort of like interaction with the Epic Scale Universe, Horus Heresy, and Warhammer 40,000. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, there'll be lots more Horus Heresy stuff coming in the weeks to come, <laughs> including work in progress is on me building terrain, expanding my forces up to 1,000 points, minus any support stuff, so my Luna Wolves and stuff getting added onto with stuff that was already available, um, or will be, I think, available right away at launch. Um, and then I'm just going to pause and wait. I'm going to add, I'm going to add the things that are available. I'm going to wait for things to come out and I'm going to slowly enjoy building and painting these armies over time. So big thanks for watching. Thanks for having me, Ash. Have a great day.